Hello, everybody. Welcome to our closing session. Uh, welcome, Hilde Hen, and uh, welcome, Rolf Huge. Um, we're just trying to detect Helen. She should be around somewhere. And maybe also the other session chairs. Freddy, please be uh, free to join us as well, and everybody else. Um, if you're still around, and um, I see David as well. Yeah. Um, if you're really behind your screen, <laughs> you can put on your camera, you know, so that we can see your face. So nice to see you all together. Yeah, Tom, we can see your chin. <laughs> Need to bend a little bit. Okay. So for this closing, closing session, I still, I still see even on a Friday evening, people are coming in to join us, which is really, really nice. I want to introduce you the two people that we thought would be really nice to share some thoughts with us. And that's um, two people, uh, professors from our faculty. It's Hilde Hane, who is a professor in uh, architectural theory. Uh, she specialized in modernity, modernism, and gender in architecture, and has extensively written about that. Um, she co-edited the 2012 Sage Handbook of Architectural Theory, and also wrote intellectual biography on Moholy Nash. So this is quite a theoretical background um, and uh, theoretical, let's say scientific research that we have on the one side. And on the other side, we invited Rolf Puch, who only recently joined our institution from uh, RMIT. And now with us at KU Leuven, he's professor in the epistemology of design-led research. He's also director of artistic research for the experimental architecture group. As a writer, um, he's, um, um, he writes in between creative and critical genres. And uh, he's been asked by uh, several European uh, national research councils, councils um, to advise in the strategic development, implementation, evaluation of artistic and design-led research. So this is really um, an expert for us, Rolf, uh, in, uh, no, you are, not only to us, uh, in this artistic-based research. And um, maybe this, this for me is like an, an opening question to you. So we would like you to generally, generally reflect on the last two days in which we saw many uh, researchers uh, from different backgrounds, practicing architects, but also others, thinking about architectural practice um, and, and theor theoreticizing that, doing research on that, or thinking about um, architectural research and the practice of that. So he hovering in between these two. And one thing uh, definitely came out of that. That's that um, somehow all of the speakers, the 24 of them, uh, also the keynotes, um, we remain in the field of scientific research, or that's what we endeavor and that's what we try to do. We all produce this paper um, that is ready to be peer reviewed and we all wanna to submit to this format of a conference so that we have a common ground to communicate. And I think we all went for these three things, uh, Rolf, that you pointed out before, you pointed out before, which is novelty and originality significance in the field, but also rigor and scientific reliability. I think this, these are all these qualities that we, we try to really uh, go after. Then there's this other thing that seeps in, in completely different ways and with, through different layers. And that's this idea of sub subjectivity, interpretation and speculation. So where's the common ground? Where's the position of these researchers? Um, in their exchange and communication on design research, architecture, architecture culture, buildings and experience, time, we had oral history, we had tracings, we had applied and speculative research, all these things together. How, how can we see that? How can we position that and find some threads? What threads did you find? Um, <laughs> is, it, is it a question? To Sorry, who's the question directed towards? Well, maybe let's start with you, Rolf. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Caroline, for that nice introduction. And also for organising this fantastic conference. It's really been a really impressive achievement to you and your team to, uh, first of all, attract such a rich um, field of contributors. And, um, and secondly, to 
uh, pull this off on a sort of uh, digital um, mediation and yet still feel like a conference. You know, all it lacked was the, uh, the coffee uh, gossip and <laughs> the, the evening socialising. So thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to correct two things in your uh, introduction. One is that I'm not from MIT, I've actually never been there, but um, I was at Newcastle University before I came here with the uh, Katie. Me. Sorry, Rolf. No problem. And then before that, I was in Sweden for 24 odd years. Um, so, um, and then the other thing was that you mentioned novelty, originality, and rigor. I think that's not my um, proposal. That's that was I was quoting a Swedish uh, research council report about that was advocating those uh, uh, categories and also for artistic research. So that's just a, a bit of. Um, <clears throat> housekeeping. What I wanted to do, what I thought would be useful to do to start the reflections with was just to remind us of um, Hilda's question, uh, which is there in the program, are architects who write a dying race? Um, tempting to say yes, but then we're all a dying race, but <laughs> let's, it's Friday evening, so let's not go there. Um, and I just wanted to sort of pull that up again. And also uh, I wanted to sort of cite Caroline's uh, last question in her preface to the programme, which was, what can practising architects bring to the table in an academic context when they are researching, drawing and writing? To what extent can a discussion on the tools and methods of practising architects deepen the academic debate and enter the fields of architectural history and theory? So um, I feel like I've been witnessing over the last couple of days the expansion of a field of research. Um, it feels like the humanities has been brought into proximity with bodies, abandoned bells, greasy butter paper, imagined utopias alongside creaking floorboards and cracked windows, lived experience and memory. In other words, all the riches of sensory knowledge and in the process, the field starts to shape change, or perhaps it learns to breathe in a different way and create new alliances. So at the start of the conference yesterday morning, I started to notice the appearance of a number of oppositions that were being banded around. So I started jotting these down as they occurred over the two days. They included things like theory and practice, writing and drawing, text and image, representation and action, reflection and action, scientist and designer, object and subject, and so on. And writing was, has, has been discussed uh, repeatedly, um, especially yesterday, I think, but there's been very little discussion about what we mean by writing. Um, writing, I think, has been assumed to serve an explanatory function so I wonder what other genres, what other genre genres might we consider? What hybrid genres, for example? And I, I think I've always been drawn to the to hybrids. Um, I've been, as you mentioned in the, in the introduction, working with artistic research, which arguably is itself a sort of hybrid. Um, you know, is it artistic? Is it research? Is it neither nor, or is it both and? And also, in in literary terms, my practice as a as well as a sort of um, academic writer, I'm also um, a fiction writer and, and a prose poet. And my favoured form is the prose poem, which itself is a monstrous genre. It's a monstrous combination of prose and poetry. It's, you know, it looks like prose, but it contains the techniques of poetry. So it's neither or, neither nor and both and again, or, or a monster form. But it might also be, um, this might also raise the sort, of, the sort of forms of convergence that Carlo Menon was talking about yesterday in discussing the, the relationship between architecture and publishing. So my own PhD, as you mentioned, is, was a PhD, it was the first of its kind actually in the UK, a P, um, PhD in creative and critical writing. That was 26 years ago, I'm horrified to recall. And um, Basically, it meant I wrote a novel about an imaginary city for my PhD, and then I wrote an essay about the process of writing the novel about the imaginary city, which became a sort of exercise in the tightrope walking, in a sense. Um, but it meant that ever since then, I've been very interested in this question about, you know, writing and different modalities of writing, different 
encoding of authority or, or, or uh, questions like perspective, which are also used in architecture, perspective, point of view, questions that you might ask of a work of fiction, like who is standing where to say what to whom, with what distance and with what motivations. You can also bring those types of questions into uh, academic texts. And of course, feminism and post-colonial studies has been instrumental in sort of uh, um, deconstructing the so-called objectivity of uh, scientific or academic texts and bringing back the, the, the contribution of lived experience, the specificities of gender, of sexuality, of the body, of race and class and so on. So I think those, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying not here to create oppositions, but rather to create fusions or monstrous alliances in a sense. Um, so on the one side, we have writing as explanation. And in, in a sense, the academic essay is a sort of pinnacle of a, what you could call technologies of the word uh, geared towards a, serving an explanatory function with its codes of precision and justification and legitimacy and primary and secondary sources, bibliography, etc., etc., all to do with accountability, you know, justifying your arguments. But there's another version of writing, which is writing as discovery or perhaps a form of sketching. Maybe this relates to uh, the drawing without preconceptions. And perhaps it's an example of the beautifully unsure that Louis Mays was speaking of yesterday. So there I'd like to say, you know, just like, um, uh, we can take a line for a walk and see where it leads us, as Paul Clay proposed in his sketchbooks. So we can take uh, a, a sentence for a walk or be taken for a walk by the sentence and see, see that as a sort of sketching process. Uh, writing, in other words, doesn't have to be a sort of after the event occurrence where you write up, <laughs> you know, you represent what happens, but it can actually be part of a, a design process, as you all know. But another version of writing that I'd like to sort of put on the table is the idea of complexifying through writing the original question. And that can also occur through uh, forms of co-authorship and also um, the term that we've used at the Experimental Architecture Group with my colleagues Rachel Armstrong and Simone Ferracina, we've developed this idea of composting, writing as a sort of composting, whereby the individual texts are sort of brought together, they're sort of pressed over each other and you know, people write over each other's texts. Nobody really is precious about their own work and in the process um, a sort of co-created text emerges that, um, that is almost invariably more interesting than the sum of its individual contributions. So that idea of composting, that you, you, you let ideas sort of um, chemically react over time uh, by a sort of release of control and mastery, I think is an important uh, and interesting idea, not least because it requires a great deal of trust. You know, uh, in place of control and mastery, I think what becomes all important is principles of care and, atten care and attention. You know, so uh, that element of trust. And I think linked to this is an idea of um, what I would call an expanded notion of literacy. So, you know, we, we have one version of literacy where we read and understand our uh, scientific texts or academic texts and so on. But there's another version which I think is emerging from artistic research, which is, again, not only, <laughs> but also um, a, a form of literacy which um, we could call exposition. And I take that term from the Journal of Artistic Research, which I was uh, partly involved in developing when I was uh, a member of the board of the Society for Artistic Research. Um, there are basically two online uh, tools which were created to try to give artistic researchers a, 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 a reconceived publishing tool. One is called the Research Catalogue and it is the Journal of Artistic Research. So it's trying to rethink what the publishing tool could be for artistic researchers by allowing a greater sort of um, format flexibility between text, moving image, still image and sound files. And the way that those are woven together is uh, the term that's used as a form of exposition. Of course, the critique would be is they leave out the material artifact, they leave out 
the performative uh, contribution was still bound by the constraints of the computer screen. But even so, I think it's quite a useful term, or at least it has been in my, um, in my practice, because it's helped me go from what I earlier spoke of as giving an account. Uh, this is a term I took from Judith Butler's fantastic essay called Giving an Account of Oneself, where she talks about the ethical challenges of you know, giving an account of oneself that is, is typically experienced at things like funerals, where you have to you know, give an account of a person's life. And what a tremendous responsibility and ethical challenge that is. Um, but it struck me when I read um, Judith Butler's essay was that this was also a very uh, useful analogy to the responsibility and the challenge of giving an account of an artistic artifact when it's being presented as a contribution to research. In other words, how you do that without reducing the, the sensory qualities, the, the qualities of outside language, and also the nuances and the complexity, you know, not simply turning it into a, a sort of caption or an explanation. So expositions helped me to go from that in my early thinking as you know, very much thinking of giving an account of a work then I realized that that is still very logocentric, it's still rooted in the word. So exposition then allowed me to think of the idea of staging an encounter. And this is what I mean by an expanded form of literacy. You stage an encounter with uh, the artifact or the, um, the material object or indeed the building. Then um, the challenge then is how to stage the encounter such that the contribution to research becomes either implicit or explicit. Um, and, uh, and that for me is a, is a more useful uh, term because it brings in the idea of curating and it brings in the idea of the distribution of artifacts in space. And at this point, when I talk about this, I usually show an OMA slide showing this fantastic exhibition, <laughs> ex exhibition sl slide and uh, invite people to think of an exhibition as a sort of spatialized essay in which instead of reading sequentially like we do with an essay you move through space and you choose how long to linger on each of the curated events that have been placed in space um, and so you as a as a sort of reader you become um, a sort of co-creator and how you move around that space and how long you decide to linger on each element so i'm going to sort of wrap up really uh, by then inviting us to think about um, you know, what happens when we bring alongside the essay forms um, these other unconventional research objects or outputs. Um, the, the, the introduction of experience, you know, we've had some great examples of the last two days, such as living inside of the object that you study in order to experience it. Um, Travelling to meet the interview subjects in order to soak up the atmosphere not just uh, not just the verbal uh, contribution of the interview subjects um, and so with that we also have uh, different forms of knowledge we have the sort of propositional forms of knowledge but also tacit knowledge that's been mentioned and even ineffable forms of knowledge we also have the possibility of uh, new research artifacts and performances and if you like what we could call epistemic things, the introduction of epistemic things into the conversation. So again, I don't want to offer this as an opposition, but, um, but rather as a sort of, uh, as, a sort of uh, as a scale perhaps, or as a different modalities of, or different forms of emphasis. On the one side, you have, if you like, degrees of uh, transparency modes of explanation which are often you know concerned with clarity and with truth via evidence and authority the construction of uh, of, a, of a sort of as was mentioned there are no um, transparent uh, um, deliveries of information but still the codes of, uh, of of presentation are on that side and on the other side of this scale there is things like immersive experience degrees of opacity or density, complexity. Um, and here, instead of uh, truth and verification, we might talk, we might need to talk about preferences. Um, we might need to actively involve our community in constructing 
um, value and also configuring our responses, having a conversation about our experience. Did you experience what I experienced just now when we studied that building or when we encountered that researcher's presentation of her work? Um, so in other words, we're talking about, in that sense, the co-creation of value. So finally, I would say that instead of disciplinary silos and um, systems of reward that are based on cultures of virtuosity, we might want to think about design interfaces between researchers and peers such that we co-create answers to the question, what do we value? And here I'm struck by a point that was made, I think it was by Patrick Lynch, citing Aristotle's ethics when he writes that the point of knowledge is friendship and the expression of friendship is the city. But if so, then I think it's likely to be a city like Ghent, where there's not only a, I'm, I'm speaking from Ghent, so I'm you know, proudly uh, ad advocating my new home, a city like Ghent, where there's not only respect for history, but also a great variety of building types that seem to coexist through a civic tolerance of difference and repurposing. So in other words, I would agree with uh, Sophie Sara's earlier point that we should sit down together and compare the epistemological assumptions of our various approaches to research so that we can understand how the tools that we use shape the horizons of our thinking. And we can learn how to exchange approaches to increase our choices as researchers. So this is to create a sort of research culture of experimentation and risk taking. And as I mentioned, this requires trust and dialogue over judgment and monologue. So what are the stories about the world that we wish to tell and who is telling them who or what is excluded? And here we might also pause to think and ask the question, who will give voice for the more than human perspectives that tend to be neglected in architectural research? And then we could also go on to talk about interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary perspectives and the challenge those pose for a sort of epistemological uh, evaluation of such work because those, those positions tend to be partial. Uh, so we need to have, again, a great deal of agility if we were to evaluate uh, interdisciplinary, especially transdisciplinary work. Um, and finally, um, I, no, I'll end there, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Uh, that's just an attempt to sort of open up some of the, um, um, some of the um, points that I uh, picked up in terms of uh, attitudes to research and um, particularly the juxtaposition of the very many, the very sort of rich and uh, greatly varied presentations. It was very interesting what sort of starts to emerge over two days when you start to uh, set up these resonances and echoes across the, uh, the various sessions. So thank you for the, thank you for creating this so expertly. I want, I was saying thank you so much, Rolf, and although we're different than just artists creating, because we're not really endeavoring to talk about our own work, we want to talk about others and talk about the world and society and architecture mm. in general or other buildings or whatever. I think we should learn about these artistic methodologies that could expand our field. And I'm sure we've seen many things today. Um, Hilda, maybe you want to say something about that as well. Yes. Um, I, I have prepared uh, some notes um, and uh, like Rolf, I want to start with uh, congratulating you on the organization of such a smoothly run conference. Unfortunately, I was only able uh, to really participate yesterday. Today I had other obligations, uh, but it really was uh, very rich and uh, I learned a lot. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, I have furthermore, um, uh, three uh, points I want to address. First, I also want to say something about the potentially dying race of the writing architect. And then I want to reflect a bit on, on the issue of criticality. And then 
also my last point was also about interdisciplinarity. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this, uh, you started indeed with uh, quoting myself, uh, uh, and I was um, questioning whether writing architects might be on the path of extinction. And I cannot help, but I have noticed, of course, that only roughly one third, I think, of the presenters in this conference are currently practicing, archi practicing architects themselves. The other two thirds probably know quite well, um, have practiced maybe in the past, but now I would, uh, they, they self-identify or I read from their uh, short bios that they are critics and authors and editors and curators and educators and academics um, more than that they are practicing architects. Uh, so I, th um, I think that um, uh, it's quite a struggle. We have had this push towards uh, more research in the architectural institutions. And I think that that's very, very good that that happened. And it certainly has, as we heard uh, uh, yesterday and today also, I assume, uh, it certainly has enhanced and, and, and enriched uh, the discourse and contributed towards what you call this uh, discursive practice. Still, I think it's a real struggle for many people uh, to, uh, to really ex excel in three different things, namely practicing architecture, doing research and educating uh, the next generation. It's, I think it's, it's a really a hard, um, a tough thing to do. And so I see that many uh, uh, who are uh, successful in this uh, are successful based on a temporal sequence. They are first practicing architects and then they become PhD students. And, uh, um, uh, something like that, or they finish their PhD and they return to practice and then uh, afterwards start to teach. Uh, so it's a hard thing, I think, and I'm not sure, and in that, in that way I, I stand by my question, I continue to stand by my question, if we are to make an anthology of uh, uh, important texts of, for architectural theory of the first uh, two decades of the 20th century, how many practicing architects would end up in that in that anthology? I'm not sure. So, but uh, in that sense, I think this was also this conference also has been, um, yeah, on the one hand, um, uh, contradicting my uh, uh, my proposition. On the other hand, I'm not so sure whether it really was contradicted. Okay, but leaving that aside, and I think uh, many of uh, many people in the audience will recognize how difficult this thing is to do the three things together. I also wanted um, to uh, to voice um, um, a certain yeah a, a, a certain disappointment also, um, which has to do with this issue of criticality. I think in Helen Thomas's keynote uh, lecture yesterday, she um, spoke about three areas of concern, or that's at least how I noted it down, the social, the political, and the creative. And my feeling for yesterday, at least, maybe today was a bit different, although if I look at the abstracts, not that different, I think, uh, the focus of uh, most of the people, uh, papers was on the last aspect, the creative aspect. Um, uh, how architects do things and how to interpret and how to critically analyze uh, what they do. The creative, the poesis, so to say, the making, um, uh, the poetical um, uh, took central stage. And I think that's okay. So it was about drawing and sketching and tracing and arranging and configuring and materializing and constructing and so on, the poetical, the making. Um, but for me, that also meant that the social and the political were a bit, a bit um, pushed into the background. And uh, that's where my disappointment uh, was. And judging from the chat, this 
concern has come up earlier in the conversation today also. Because I think it's important that in architectural research, we indeed um, continue de develop this develop, uh, to develop this understanding of what architects do and how they do it and what are the tools of, of the trade and what are, what does it mean to draw, sketch, etc. Uh, this exposition um, that, that Rolf was uh, uh, mentioning, uh, this expanded notion of literacy, I think it's absolutely necessary and it's a good thing that we have now much more of this type of research. Uh, but I think that uh, echoing Helen, I think, or at least that's how I understood Helen Thomas, the social and the political stand for the why. How we do architecture is one thing, but why do we do it? And for me, uh, and again, I think uh, I'm, I'm closer to Rolf than maybe at first, um, uh, at first sight one would think, but Rolf mentioned at the end, the friendship and the city, for me, friendship and the city stands in for indeed a uh, society, the social and the political also. And that was why, uh, that was, I think, less present or there were only, yeah, not so many papers who succeeded very convincingly in doing both. Um, and one of the speakers of yesterday referred to Adorno, but for me, that, that's an import, a very important reference because for me the most important thing about Adorno was that he really developed um, a critique of art as art in an autonomous way as we uh, are developing the tools of our trade, uh, uh, understanding and criticizing and analyzing and what is architecture and how do we do it, but that he at the same time Adorno was very, very um, radical in saying art, a work of art, is also socially relevant, is also embodies also social critique and political critique. And we, we uh, talked far less about that. And that was where my disappoint, my slight disappointment uh, stems from. For example, I want to remind people who, um, who know that uh, building and that project, Walter van Acker gave us a fantastic paper discussing the Ninth Square um, uh, Villa of uh, Office in Buggenhout. And I think it, it was, um, I learned a lot in uh, understanding better the long trajectory of this Ninth Square grid from uh, Palladio onwards over Heiduk and Eisenman and you name them. Uh, that was um, very informative to see that um, that uh, traced out. At the same time, for me, the, this villa is also important because it embodies a criticism of the, 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 the Flemish and the Belgian way of uh, uh, doing um, uh, of parcellation, the, the verkaveling, the Belgische verkaveling, to say it in Dutch, and the unsustainability of that particular form of uh, spatial practice. And, and the processes that, that are, that are um, uh, part of that. So that it's, and this level of criticism uh, was not addressed by Walter. I, I'm not blaming Walter, of course, because he did what he did and that's good to have a focus, but it, I'm using it as a kind of example of how one could possibly think of um, aiming for doing both, having this critique of um, criticism of and critical analysis of the forms and, and the tools of uh, um, how we do architecture. And at the same time, um, uh, really teasing out the social content, uh, the political um, meaning that also might be embodied in the work. And uh, I, uh, fortunately, I, um, I was, uh, I was, I was uh, seeing this uh, also, of course, like uh, the very last paper of today, which I happened to be able to listen to, of Katie Lloyd Thomas and Heidi Kajita. I think did that. Uh, Wilfried Wong was referring to climate change, and so it has been there. Um, but I would uh, be happy. Uh, to to see more than that possibly um, in uh, in the future because I think ultimately why are we doing this kind of thing uh, 
to make ourselves happy, I assume, but maybe also because somehow we think that through this architectural thing we can somehow contri contribute to yeah, big words, but to improving society and so on. I'm still very modernist, eh? if you hear let me uh, speak like this. But that's indeed something that, uh, that has, has uh, stuck with me and that for me is um, an ultimate reason to be curious, to do research, to, to work on things, uh, because indeed it's the modern project, like Habermas would say, that, that, that you, uh, you bring the knowledge that, that you develop in this way, ultimately it's knowledge that um, contributes to um, the, yeah, a better future. Let's put it like that. So I think that there we could still do a better job of bringing these th different layers. I think you also spoke uh, about these layers um, in your introduction, Caroline, to, to make, make them interact better. Um, and I think we need both types of research, but we also need them to interact. I'm, I'm sure about that. And that's uh, where I want them to transition maybe to my third point about interdisciplinarity. Um, of course, uh, the, the, the title of this um, symposium referred to history and theory, research, practice, history, theory. Um, and maybe, um, yeah, and we can, we can discuss a lot about what is theory and is there a thing like theory of practice or practice of theory, etc. Um, but uh, as those of you who are a bit familiar with the Sage Handbook of Architectural Theory, you would already know that uh, in, in, let's say, my genre of theory, the theory that, um, that I um, uh, deal in, uh, social sciences are very important. And anthropology, ethnography, social geography, that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and I am also convinced that as architects and as people mastering these uh, tools of architecture, the sketching, the drawing, the designing, etc., we named, uh, you can continue to name them, that we have something to contribute to the social sciences. Um, uh, because they, uh, regardless of the spatial term, there are still a lot of social scientists who do not understand space and spatial configurations and the impact of the built environment, etc. Uh, so for me, it would also be important to think in that direction, how to use the tools and the skills of the architect uh, to contribute to uh, research that addresses social and political challenges uh, uh, like sustainability, climate change, and you name it. You name it. And uh, that's why um, uh, I think that also, um, there is also a form of, um, I mentioned it yesterday in, in one of the um, discussion sessions um, that uh, research practices by architects that, for example, um, uh, that one can see uh, in, in the pilot projects, for example, of the Flemish state architect, the Vlaamse Baumeester, or the scans of the Vlaamse Baumeester, that to me is also is, is one of these um, places where one might en encounter also a very fertile interaction between uh, research um, uh, in architecture, practice of architecture and theory of architecture. It might be developed that way. And that's the kind of thing that maybe I was also a bit um, missing uh, in the conference, but again, I didn't see everything. So maybe it was there in a kind of unexpected way. Um, and and uh, that uh, uh, it, I think it would uh, we we still need to push um, a bit further in 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 the in the direction of um, yeah this trans transdisciplinarity interdisciplinarity uh, and also I think it was it it's a necessary stage that architectural research focuses on itself and develops this kind of autonomous um, thing. Um, but it should be, well, at least I, I would hope that it, it, it's a stage that, um, that will continue to thrive, uh, but that also um, helps to make way to 
uh, another um, way of enter um, of bridging um, research uh, theory and practice and and that that is more explicitly uh, concerned with uh, social and political issues um, I leave it there but again thanks uh, it was it was really interesting okay thank you too Hilda for this um, wonderful insightful uh, remarks um, especially the second one uh, really triggers me because this somehow was the challenge of this um, symposium as well or we put it forward because yeah the subtitle is not only history and theory it's perspectives on design and its relation to history and theory and Actually, it's been in tension all over these two days. And last evening, Wang started his introduction of his lecture saying, can we just stop trying to have opinions <laughs> and, and, and critiques? <laughs> so he hoovered away from this criticality and he said, leave that to the other experts. Please let us just talk about buildings. Let's just enjoy them and let's just do design research. And help he went on and off <laughs> in a wonderful lecture for one hour, um, interweaving a little bit of criticality here and there, but definitely not what I think that you mean. Um, and so somehow it's been these two, are they opposite? That's what I start to wonder now. Do they almost like exclude each other? It's like when you really go inside a building or a design or, or a butter paper or, or, or a materiality, um, you're so much uh, in it that you, you're missing maybe a bird's eye perspective here and, and is one excluding the other? I think, yeah, um, for me that remains an open question that we definitely cannot answer here in this, in this last uh, um, couple of minutes of, of, of the symposium. Maybe some of you want to reflect on that or, or have some other remarks. Let me just add, that's why I brought in the, the example of the Villa Buchenhout of, uh, office, because I think that you can clearly analyze it from these different perspectives and they are all there as different layers in the building and what can be said about the building. So I, I'm, I'm sure that you can do both, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a difficult call and, and uh, quite a challenge and it's, yeah, yeah let me can I add something? But then I would have to ask to Colleen to. Uh, we, we're sharing. We're one of the few people who actually share a room here, so only one of us can talk because otherwise we hear each other's echo. <laughs> I think. I think uh, Hilda, it's, it's. I think it's quite interesting that you mention the social and the political, and maybe also the um, the love that everybody expressed to dive on the architectural. But what actually struck me is that. Maybe that is because we, I consider myself com one of these people that tries to combine these three ro roles, um, not at the same time, but, but sequentially indeed. And I think uh, maybe it's even that all these people that are teaching and working in practice and working in, um, in, uh, in academia, um, the social and the political is so vital via teaching, via wanting to maybe educate people to be critical or maybe via um, discussing projects in other ways. I feel, I think it's a very good point that you make because I feel that a lot of time it's actually right under the surface, maybe a few more than others, but for example, the, the, the butter paper seems to be very much an essay on a, on a, on a particular piece of paper, but but when then Laura talks about the Italian girl that actually made the drawing and that, you know, needs to be taken into account or has a, has a role, I think a lot of these uh, small instances, actually the social and the political does surface. Um, but it might be, it might be, it might have to do with the fact that there is a sense of wanting to emancipate the, um, the, the, the design uh, as, a, as, a re as a research practice. Um, but uh, but I, I feel that there is absolutely um, the social and the political are never far away. You know, uh, CISA negotiating clients, negotiating landscapes, ne negotiating circumstances. So it's maybe a different way of, of that there is of course a difference in lens. You're absolutely right. But that might have to do with the fact that basically we're all architects, so we love. <laughs> 
we love the build form. <laughs> might even be our weak spot, but it's, it's also what we're good at. So it's maybe also what we can bring to the table. But the, the, the notion that, for example, the materiality of building can be something or the, space, the spatial qualities of building is something that we can bring to the other sciences could be a very a nice next step because I do feel that we have uh, things to bring there. Yeah. But future, maybe next conference. <laughs> Okay, do we have any more thoughts, questions or remarks to close uh, off? May I say something? Please, Paolo. Uh, so just, um, I just would like to reinforce this last statement by Irene, with, with which I completely agree. Uh, I mean, maybe the, of course, the social and political questions are under the surface of, of drawing in the architectural practice. And I think it's very important to, to get deeper in these, um, uh, in these tools uh, of research in order to understand these things. In fact, when um, uh, Laura spoke about the, the, the girl that made the drawing of Caesar, of course, of course it's another research to try to understand precisely who did each drawing. And it's, it's something very important, surely, but in that I, I couldn't do it. But, uh, but, but it's, it's in a way something is under the, the, the research I'm trying to do. Another point is that uh, I don't know if it was not clear about when I think about tracing, I think about something that ha has to do with communication and, uh, and also with a common language between the various operators in the design construction. So, it's, so the social is in fact deeply embedded in this, uh, in this research, I would say, but it's not explicit in the way of a program, of a social program. And um, as far as I read um, Adorno, uh, I would say that we cannot separate form and content. And that, that's precisely maybe one of the highest points, uh, at least in my point of view, of Adorno's theory, uh, the, the aesthetic uh, critique that he made. It's precisely that the form is already the content. And so, so we, we should, in a way, study the form in order to have access to the content. So that's my thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. <laughs> You're turning it around. I like that. <laughs> Some more closing remarks. Uh, I have I have just uh, one uh, remark. Uh, I enjoyed uh, both of our uh, final commentators, uh, Ralph and Hilda. Uh, I think it was a good uh, resume of uh, what I've understood from the conference. I just wanted to underline something that Ralph said, which was about composting, uh, because I thought, I thought that was a very interesting uh, metaphor for how things can happen in, uh, let's say, uh, um, architectural communication and and production. Uh, and I would just uh, underline the fact that uh, it's, it's actually very contemporary in a certain way because uh, composting could be uh, posting together. Posting is what we do now uh, since uh, uh, for the last uh, six or seven months anyway. We, we mostly we post things. And posting together, composting, uh, is is a lot of how we communicate, and also it's a kind of a, it's also kind of an image of how things uh, get assembled in in the matter of uh, uh, architectural production. Don't so uh, uh, things getting piled on top of each other, and uh, maybe uh, 
getting moldy and having worms crawl through them and stuff like that. But uh, in the end, it's kind of fertile uh, and uh, and it's it's kind of a nice image. Composting uh, is a nice image. So I just wanted to say that and and also to thank the organizers uh, for this really wonderful conference. I haven't seen everything, but uh, I've had an immense pleasure uh, discovering. Uh, lots of really good work. I'm very inspired. I want to go back to the archives now and uh, and start uh, my research all over again. That's nice, David. Maybe you should in Rome or in Paris. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm 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 not in Rome actually, but uh, I don't know where that thing came from. But uh, whatever. <laughs> We have some nice feeds on the chat and it's Lara Harty who says it might be worth thinking in this sphere of assembly that the term is social, political, tectonic and narrative all exist on the plane of the page. <laughs> and Irina says, may I suggest a radical division of labor, the flowing line of the creative drawing can and is often thankfully autonomous. <laughs> However, its critical reading must discover and unravel its heteronomy. That's on so a beautiful note to maybe end unless somebody else feels we need to crack a nut another one <laughs> no then i just want to thank you all for joining us even now on a friday evening you're still so many everybody's here um, we already have our little glass of wine i want to say cheers <laughs> yeah let's do that let's do a round of applause. Let's all put on our micros, our mics. <laughs> Bye guys, have a nice weekend. And the recording should be by next week uh, uh, available through the website. We're working on that intensely. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.